one of the basic principles in the practice is that you have to be your own mainstay. Atahi atano nato. The self is its own mainstay, your own refuge. But as you quickly find out, you have to make yourself into something that's reliable, that you can take as a mainstay and a refuge. It's not automatic. This is on the one hand why we take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha to begin with. They give us examples of how to train ourselves so that we can eventually stand on our own two feet. And particularly so we can gain a sense of what's right and wrong, what should be believed and what shouldn't be believed. And here, as the Buddha said in his discourse to the Kalamas, on the one hand you can't take outside texts as your authority or religious traditions, but you also can't take your intuitions, your own sense of right and wrong, your own preferences. You have to test things to see what actually works and what doesn't work. On the one hand, this means that you have to put the mind in a position so it really can test things and come up with reliable results. This is why the Buddha started his instructions to Rahula when he's going to teach Rahula how to meditate by saying you have to make your mind like the earth, like water, like the wind, like fire. But of these four elements. The earth is probably the most graphic in the sense that the earth does not react. Disgusting things are thrown in the earth and the earth doesn't shrink away. You can pour a perfume on the earth and the earth doesn't get refreshed or excited by it. The earth is just earth. And you've got to learn how to develop that quality in your own mind. And notice that meditation instructions don't stop there. It doesn't say just be equanimous and non-reactive and accepting of everything. You develop this quality so you can then observe, and then you start your experiments. As when we're working with the breath. The calmer you can make the mind, the more easily you'll be able to observe what actually is healthy breathing and what's unhealthy breathing. What's energizing? And what kind of breathing drains your energy? What's relaxing? What gives rise to tension? And so this ability to make the mind still and observant and also to experiment, they have to go hand in hand. Because as you get better with dealing with the breath, the mind will be able to settle down and be even more solid. And the more solid you are, the more you'll be able to observe the subtleties of the breath. So it's not a catch-22, it's simply these two faculties of the mind, the ability to watch things and observe and come to reliable conclusions, and your inventiveness in trying out different things with the breath. They go hand in hand, and they develop together. Because a lot of things are going to come up in the meditation. On the one hand, you'll find yourself remembering things people told you about what you should do when you meditate, or what's a good meditation, what's not a good med meditation, or whether there even is such a thing as a good or a bad meditation. You have to put a little question mark against them. The same thing with intuitions that come up within the mind, that you have to do this or should do that. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. One of the most dangerous things you can do in meditation is just to believe every impulse that comes into the mind. I saw many examples in Thailand of people who actually develop some kinds of psychic powers as they're meditating. The ability to read other people's minds, to foresee future events, to remember their own past lives. 
But as it turned out, the information they were getting was not 100% reliable. And the reliable things actually made it worse. Because this worked out and that came true, and gee, everything that must come up in the mind of meditation must be true. That's what they thought. And they ended up getting further and further away from reality. This is why the Buddha said that heedfulness is the most important quality. One, to develop skillfulness in the mind, and two, to bring the practice to its consummation. On the one hand, the heedfulness keeps reminding us that this is why we're here. If we don't train the mind, we're creating dangers for ourselves. It's our basic motivation to practice and actually work on the mind to begin with, realizing that if we don't do this practice, nobody else is going to do it for us. And if we don't do it now, it's not going to get easier as time goes on. But heedfulness is also what keeps us on the path. It's a little question mark that you put next to things. Whatever comes up in the mind, whatever you hear from other people, you have to test it. We read stories of a John Munn with Devas coming to visit him and in the early years of his practice giving him instructions on how to do walking meditation, how to do sitting meditation. And it wasn't that he believed everything they said, or even necessarily believed that these really were devas coming into his mind. But he'd take the visions, he'd take the information, and treat it as that, as information recommendations for the practice. And then he'd test them, and found out that some things worked and some, some things didn't. So it's the testing that made all the difference. This is probably one of the most important qualities you can build into the mind is the ability to be a reliable investigator, a reliable reader of your experiments. Which is why this quality of the imperturbable mind is really important. The attitude of mind that can step back a little bit and just watch things, observe. What am I doing? What are the results? This is also why mindfulness and alertness are the two main qualities you need in order to develop this sense of the observer. Mindfulness, you keep things in mind. If you're going to watch how A gives rise to B, you have to be really sure that A actually is giving rise to B. That means you have to be there all the time, from the time you did the action to the time that you received the result. You can't just skip in and then run away for a while and then come back. Because who knows, maybe C, D, E, and F came in in the middle and had their influence. So you've got to be here all the time to watch and to be alert. What are you doing? When the results come, what do you do with them? Sometimes really good results come and then we get carried away, in which case our defilements have hijacked our insights. Kinana Yon keeps stressing this point again and again. Whatever insight comes up, you have to watch what happens in the mind next, and then what happens next and next. In other words, the observer has to stay functioning all the time so you can see the full ramifications of what you've done and what's happened as a result. So when you make your mind like earth, it's not just making it like a clod of dirt. You're making it solid. You're making it steady. So you can rely on it more and more. So that whatever comes up, either inside or outside, you can check. And then you check again and check again. Until you get, start getting re results that really are reliable. You see, they really do make a difference in the mind. And the difference is good. It really is an improvement. I noticed when I was staying with Ajahn Fu, he had a certain skeptical cast to his mind. He didn't quickly or easily believe things that people said. And I found out later that he had applied the same quality to his own mind. He had to learn to be 
a little bit skeptical about whatever came up, whatever visions, whatever information arose in his mind in the course of his meditation. You have to keep looking at it with a skeptical eye, because otherwise it's very easy to get taken in. And so that quality of skepticism is not an unfriendly skepticism, it's just a desire to keep watching to make sure. That's one of your main protections on the path. It gets you started on the path and it keeps you on the path all the way to the end. <laughs>